morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 53 as we continue on in our series, Against All Odds. Can we pray together? What a powerful name it is, Jesus. Mm. Lord, as we approach this text today and we once again see the overwhelming significance and magnificence of what you have done for us. And as we have just been reminded of your power and your grace and your glory, your love and your goodness, your faithfulness, Lord, I pray that we can just see this text in a context that will impact our lives and give us the encouragement and the equipment we need to endure in this world in which we live. Lord, we ask your blessing now on this time, and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's we'll start with a question today. How many of you, by a show of hands, if you're here in the room, how many of you have ever been accused of something? Anybody? Okay, good. Pretty much everybody, so I'm not alone in this. And you can be accused of a lot of things, right? Big things, good things, bad things. I mean, a lot of y'all have known me for some time. So it, this probably come as no surprise to y'all. I have three brothers, um, all younger. I'm the oldest. You may not have known that. There's four boys in our family. And I am frequently accused, I mean, all the time, really, of being the best looking and smartest one of the bunch. <laughs> it's a real burden to bear, you know, but just is what it is. Now, in all seriousness, though, I think we've all at some time been accused of something at some point in our lives, right? But let me ask you this. How many of you, again, by show of hands, how many of you have ever been falsely accused of something? <laughs> wow. Again, almost everybody, right, has been falsely accused of something. Now, it's, it's one thing to be um, rightly accused of something, we, we handle that in a different way. When we get pulled over and we were going too fast and, and the officer comes up and he says, I pulled you over because you were speeding and, and he is rightly accusing you of that, you handle that situation in a completely different way than when somebody um, is gossiping about you or just spreading rumors about you and accusing you of something you, you didn't even do, right? We handle those two situations in different ways. Today, as we approach our text in Isaiah 53, uh, we're going to see that against all odds, 700 years before Jesus was ever even born, Isaiah predicted and, and prophesied that Jesus would stand in silence as he faced his accusers against false accusations. And we're going to see five things that we learn from silence. Five things that we almost never do when it comes to silence that Jesus does and is our example and our model of. So here is our text for today, Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, Isaiah said. Like a lamb led to slaughter and like a sheep, silent before his shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion." The big idea for today, the thing I really want you to grasp and take hold of, the thing you're going to hear me say quite a bit as we move our way through this text is this. When you listen closely, you will always be surprised by silence. When you listen closely, you will be surprised by silence. If there's one thing I've come to realize, one thing I've come to value more and more as I've gotten older, it's the value of silence. Can I get an amen? amen. I, I think it's just something about maturing. It's something about getting older 
that we, we value silence more. And I've come to realize much more than I did in my, my teens or my 20s or my 30s, I've come to realize increasingly that our world is a loud place, amen? It is a loud, loud world in which we live. There's, there's almost no place you can go to escape the noise. There's almost no place you can go to find true silence. Whether it's the, the, the ding of the notification on your phone, your cellular device, your tablet, your computer, or whether it's the noise of traffic on the roads or traffic in the air above us, whether it's a TV or a radio playing in the background or a million other things, the reality is our world is a very, very loud place. And it's so loud, and we're so used to the noise. We've become conditioned to the noise. So much so that when it's silent, it makes us uncomfortable. We're, we're uncomfortable in the silence because we're not used to things being quiet. We long for, I believe, in our flesh. Um, we long for, we're drawn like a moth to the flame toward a loud world, a noisy world. For whatever reason, our flesh is drawn to chaos and loudness and noise. But there's a huge problem with that. The problem is God is most easily found and heard in the silence of life, not the noise of life. I love 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13, which says this. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence at that moment, the Lord passed by, and a great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering the cliffs before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. Can you imagine how noisy that would have been, that wind? And then after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice. A soft whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave and suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He would have never heard that in the midst of the noise because it was a soft, gentle whisper. I can personally attest to you that the four most significant revelations and callings in my life, I've heard all of them in the deepest silence somebody can experience. My call to salvation, my call to ministry, my call to marry my wife, Abby, and my calling to come to this church now 20 years ago, all were received in total silence. So quiet, I, I can remember all four of those times distinctly. And the one thing they all have in common, they all happened in different places, at different times, they came about in different ways, but they all have this in common. In those moments, I heard those revelations from the Lord, and I heard those four significant callings in my life. The entire world around me felt as if it had stopped. It felt as if it was the Lord and I, and we, that was all that existed in the entire universe was just me and him. It was the deepest, most significant silence you can experience. My mind, my heart, my ears, everything was quiet. And all four of those things surprised me, which is why I say when you listen closely, you will be surprised by silence. Today I'd like to show you five surprising things we learned from the silence of Christ as he kept his mouth shut. Five things we can apply to our lives, five things we need to learn, five things we need to remember. The first one is this, it is possible to suffer in silence. It's possible to suffer in silence. Now nobody wants to suffer, period, 
But let's be honest. If we're going to suffer, we ain't going to be silent about it, are we? I mean, we don't even want to be inconvenienced. But, it, but if, if, if it gets uncomfortable and the situation rises to the level of suffering, what do we do when we're suffering? We make sure everybody knows about it. We're going to put it on social media. We're going to call everybody we think will pick up the phone and listen to us. And we're going to tell them about our suffering. You're going to get your side of the story out to everybody you can, particularly if you're suffering because you've been falsely accused of something. It's kind of like my kids. I can ask my kids to do the simplest task, something they they all have to do. They all take turns doing this, have four kids. So each week, it's one kid's responsibility to take the garbage can out to the road. It's a simple task. But every time, every week, no matter which kid it is, it turns into a 30-minute conversation about how mistreated they are, how tough it is. There's always an issue. It's always too hot or too cold. It's too dark. It's too far to the road. The cans are too heavy. Or they have too much homework to do. It's amazing how motivated they are to do their homework when it's time to take out the trash. They would rather do their homework than just wheel it out to the road. We don't live that far from the road. A little off the road, but not that far. And if they're going to have to suffer, everyone's going to know about it. Everybody in the whole house knows about it. They'll tell their friends about it. I hear them on the phone. Oh, my dad's making me take out the trash again. I can't believe I got to do this. It's 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 such a horrible life I have. Everybody's going to know about it. I mean, we might suffer, but if we're going to suffer, we're not going to do it in silence. Church, can I remind you, suffering is a part of following Jesus. Peter said this in 1 Peter 4.12, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. Just like those trash cans got to go out every Wednesday at our house, suffering is going to find each and every one of us if we're following Jesus. Paul said this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's a specific kind of suffering, but it's a reality for us. Jesus said himself in Matthew chapter 10, 22, You will be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Indeed, endurance is one of the most overlooked themes in the Bible for God's people. Why would Jesus talk about the need to endure if there was not going to be suffering? Find me a single example of a faithful man or woman in the Bible that did not suffer. You can't do it, they don't exist. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, was the most faithful of all, and he suffered the most of all. This is why Peter proclaims that Jesus is our example to follow in suffering. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. For you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and the overseers of your soul. Jesus endured six, six unjust trials. 
And during those six unjust, illegal trials, most of them, he suffered the most unimaginable ridicule, the most unimaginable physical suffering, the most imaginable verbal torture you, you, you can come up with in your mind. It, it, it is unthinkable agony from the time he is arrested to the time he breathes his last and says it is finished. And through it all, if we see nothing else, we see him suffering in silence. Matthew records it like this. The high priest stood up and said to him, don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent, verse 63. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. To that, all Jesus says in verse 64 is, you have said it. But I tell you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robe and said, he has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? See, now you've heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and they beat him. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah. Who was it that hit you? It is okay to suffer in silence. And it is possible that God will call you to suffer in silence. And when you listen closely, you will always be surprised by what you hear in that silence. There's a second thing we learn from Jesus and can apply to our lives, and that is this. It's possible to submit in silence. The Word of God has much to say about submission and our responsibility in this area as believers. As a quick survey of it, we are, for example, called to submit to one another according to Ephesians 5.21 and many other places. We are called to submit to God in places like James chapter 4, verse 7, and many other places. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, tells us that we are to submit to our leaders, and it's other places too. We're called to live in submission to our government, according to Romans 13 and other places. And we all know about the most famous one of all, that the scriptures declare that wives are sub to submit to their husbands. To be sure, there's context that goes with each and every one of these things I very quickly mentioned. We don't have time today to dive into the context or to unpack the context around them. But I simply want to point out the Bible has a lot to say about submission. But how many times do we submit in silence? To me, this is one of the most surprising things about the passion of Christ. It's his unwavering submission to his father and to his mission and the silence in which he endures it. What did Isaiah say? He said, yet he did not open his mouth. Church, can I just be honest with you? There are many today who claim to be living in submission to Christ, but they keep opening their mouth. They say their submission is, is all that's on their mind and heart. But all I keep hearing from their mouth is excuses. They say submission is their goal and their aim. But all I see from their life is self-promotion. They say submission is what they are and what they're all about. But they keep trying to tell their side of the story. In the garden, Jesus said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then he shut his mouth. And he submitted his life to his father's plan. Look at what John 10 says. Again, the words of Christ, verse 17. This is why the father loves me, because I lay down my life. So that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. 
He laid his life down on his own. Nobody took it from him. He willingly, submissively laid down on that cross, was tacked to that tree, and died a criminal's death. And he kept his mouth shut through the whole thing, for the most part. Imagine how our church and our families and even our world would be different if we could just grasp the power of this one truth found in the silence of submission. When you listen closely, you'll be surprised by the silence. There's a third thing we see that's possible in silence, and that is it's possible to serve in silence. It's possible to serve in silence. As was the case with our suffering and submission, when it comes to service, we rarely want to do that in silence. No, we want to make sure everybody knows that we're serving, don't we? Church, believe me when I say this, some of the most special servants in God's kingdom are the ones you never see or hear. They're the ones you never see or hear anything about. They are the ones who silently go about doing what God has called them to do. Never asking for anything, never expecting any kind of recognition or applause for their actions or their efforts. They are satisfied completely with just being the hands and feet that Jesus has called them to be. Few do it, but it is totally possible to serve in silence. I think it's important here to note a point that that has to be said. And that is this. It's really with service, it's the heart that matters, right? It's not what you see with your eyes or what you hear with your ears. It's the heart of the servant. Not everybody is going to be able to serve in silence or obscurity. For example, Jesus himself. He was heard and seen by many. Thousands of people followed Jesus. He was neither stealthy or silent most of his ministry. Crowds followed him everywhere he went, but his heart was pure. And when it came time to die and to serve humanity in that way, he was silent. But for much of his ministry, he wasn't. He was very well known. He was out there. He was a public figure, if you will. It would be impossible for many people to serve in silence, to fulfill their calling that God has put on their life. Some people have to to do it. Take me, for example. It it would be impossible for me to fulfill my calling if you never heard me or saw me. My calling is tied to people seeing me and hearing me. In the same way, people who stand at our front door and greet you on the way in, it would be impossible for them to, to serve in the way God's called them to serve and never be seen or heard. Because God has called them to greet you as you're coming in, right? So the the issue is is not whether you see people or whether you hear people. The issue is what is the condition of their heart and the motivation behind what they're doing. The question is, are they there for the right reasons? If your heart is right, then your service is always right. But it starts and ends with the motivation and the desire of your heart. Jesus is our example in this as with everything else. He came to serve the entire world. What did John say? John, in John chapter 1, I mean at the beginning, he calls it. The next day, John saw Jesus coming, this is verse 29, coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about, John said. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed in Israel, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. John said, this man is going to serve us all. John chapter 1, verse 35. If you jump down just a little bit further. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and when they saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. The picture, this picture of a silent, suffering, submissive lamb serving all of humanity is exactly what Isaiah was talking about 700 years before Jesus was ever born in Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. 
Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before his shearers, he did not open his mouth. Indeed, he was and is and always will be the Lamb of God who served the entire world by becoming the sacrificial lamb for our sins. And the power of his service to all of humanity came from the depth of silence. He did not open his mouth. What a lesson there is to be learned there. You don't have to be loud to be significant in God's kingdom. You don't have to be known to matter in God's economy. You don't have to be heard to be considered faithful by God. It is completely possible to serve God in silence with a pure and humble heart. There's been no greater servant in all of history than Jesus. And in the end, he served with his mouth shut in silence. I love this great reminder from the psalmist. We should all aim for this and make it our goal. He says in Psalms 37, 5 through 7, Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Making your righteousness shine like the dawn and your justice like the noonday. He says, Be silent before the Lord, and wait expectedly for him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, but the person who carries out evil plans. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. When you listen closely, you will always be surprised by what you hear in the silence. The fourth thing we see when we come and we listen closely to the silence is this, it's possible to share love in silence. It's possible to share love in silence. Too many times we forget this powerful truth. We forget what a powerful thing love is. We tend to forget that love is so powerful, words are not even required in order to share it or experience it. It's possible to love others in very meaningful ways, largely in silence. A while back, a couple approached me after service. I was shaking hands as I always do. And they came up and they told me they were from Arizona and they were visiting the area and they just wanted to come and worship with us. They watch our online service every week. That was their testimony. They had traveled to Texas to see some family or some friends and they decided to make an extra trip just to come here and worship with us. And then they handed me a bag and inside that bag there were some gifts they said they were for me. They just they had just they were encouragers, you know, they had that gift, that gift of encouragement. They went on and on saying how much they appreciated me and my ministry and my preaching and blah 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 blah. They kept going on about that. And um it, it, it was great, but it was busy, right? That's a busy time for me. People are coming out and still putting their hands out, and I'm still trying to shake hands, but be engaged here. And I, and I remember distinctly as our conversation was kind of coming to a close, and again, people were still all around and coming by, I, I told them thank you and how much I appreciated it. And then I asked, I said, hey, are your names inside the bag? And they said, yeah, we put a card in there for you, and our names are in there. Because I knew by the time I was done with the second service, and I shook more hands and everything, I was probably going to forget names. I'm bad with names. You all know that. Say said, yes, our names are in the bag with a card. And so later that day, I opened up the bag and I was unwrapping the stuff they gave me, just some very sweet things, a prayer book and a cross and a couple of things like that. And then I opened their card. That card was so sweet and it was so encouraging. Again, these are encouragers. And my, my intention from the very beginning was to write them a thank you note. And inside their card was their names, <laughs> their first names. No last name, no address, no phone number, no nothing. I searched our database. We looked a couple different ways. I asked some staff to try to help me figure out who they might be or, or whatever, and their names weren't there. They didn't fill out a visitor's card that Sunday. So I have no way to contact them. I have no way to tell them thank you other than just say thank you if you're watching today. But my point is this. Their powerful, simple, gentle, very quiet gesture of appreciation and love is something I will never forget. Love is like that. 
It doesn't have to be loud to be powerful. 1 John encourages us in this way. He says, little children, verse 18, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and truth. In other words, love is about what we do more than it is about what we say or what others see. Again, it's about the heart. Jesus was largely silent in his final hours on the earth, but It's in these same hours we see his love for us in the most powerful way. John 3, 16 and 17, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Love. Love was the genesis of it all. And love is frequently, I think you can testify to this too, it's frequently the loudest in the absence of words. You can love people loudly in silence. Jesus said very little with his mouth during these hours of his life, but he said a whole lot with his life and with his death. That's a powerful lesson we should remember. I love this verse from 1 John 4, 9 through 11. God's love was revealed among us in this way. How was God's love revealed to us? God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. And he says this in verse 10. Love consists in this. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. The prophet Isaiah was right when he said, like a lamb led to slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. That happened over 700 years after he wrote those words down against all odds. But nobody can deny the power of his love. May I remind you one more time that when you listen closely, you'll be surprised by what can happen in the silence. There's one final surprising thing we can see from the testimony of Christ and his silence by not opening his mouth. Perhaps this is the most surprising of all, and perhaps this is the reason why most of us don't ever want to be silent. There is another possibility, a fifth one. It's this. It's possible to reign or remain supreme even in the silence. It's possible to remain supreme in silence. That's surprising, isn't it? It's frequently forgotten in a world where the squeaky wheel always gets the grease. It's surprising in a world that looks upon silence as a sign of weakness or a sign of guilt. This is surprising in a world that sees silence as a Symbol of cowardness and frailty. We're scared to be silent because we might lose respect or position or popularity or we might lose praise that we think is due us if we keep our mouths shut. But is that really true? Jesus remained silent in the presence of his false accusers. But does the word of God not declare in Philippians 2, 9 through 11 for this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Does Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20 through 23 not say he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. He kept his mouth shut and he was silent, but he still remained supreme. He's over it all still. 
Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. That is the power of the name of Jesus. Isaiah said, like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. But when John gives us a a, a glimpse of heaven, where do we see our silent, suffering, submissive Savior? Where do we see him there in glory? Well, it says this in Revelation 5, 11 through 13. Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. And they said with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature, he reports, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Despite his silence... Our Savior is still supreme. When you listen closely, you will be surprised by the silence. As we close our time together, hearing God's word, I'd like to ask you a question. It's a simple question, but an important one, and that is simply this. Do you know him? Do you know our Savior? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Does he live actively inside of you if the answer to that is no I want to encourage you this morning to listen very carefully not to me but to the silence that we're about to enter into because you might just be surprised there in that silence to hear Jesus call your name just like I was several decades ago You might find yourself in a place where the whole world stops and all the noise and distractions that surround us go away and just for a moment, it's just you and the Lord and that's all that exists in the whole universe and there in that deep, deepest of all silences, he might give you that privilege and call your name. And in that moment, you have a choice to make. You can respond with, yes, Lord, it's me. You can repent of your sins, and you can submit your life to him in that silence. Or you can exit that silence, and you can leave without being changed. And you can remain in your sin and the darkness that follows it. Listen closely. You'll be surprised by what you hear in the silence. Let's pray. If you sense and feel and hear him calling your name today, we don't ask you to rise or raise a hand or say anything out loud we just ask you to remain there in the silence at the feet of your Savior to repent of your sins and to submissively give your life to Him to confess and to believe so if that's you this day and you're the one or one of the ones who needs to do that and handle your business with the Lord there in the silence we invite you to just pray with us say this, say Lord it's me here I am In the silence confronted by my sins, I am not falsely accused of them. I am rightly accused of them because I am a sinner. And you are the only solution to my sin. So Lord, I ask that you would forgive me, that you would change me, 
in faith. I ask that you would take my sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west. That you would make me new. I thank you for what you did for me in the silence of that day as you endured your passion, your persecution, your punishment that should have been mine. I thank you for dying for me so that I can now live for you. Thank you for your grace. Lord, as we close today, we thank you for those who have heard for the first time today your voice in the silence. And Lord, just as I pray for them, I'll pray for all of us who've heard that voice, even if it's been some time ago. We know that if we listen close, we're surprised by the silence and what is done there in it, what we hear when we're there with you. And so, Lord, I pray if nothing else today would encourage those of us who are followers and believers in you. Lord, I pray that it would encourage us to seek the silence more. To desire it. To not be intimidated by it or uncomfortable in it. But to desire just to be there at your feet. So we can be pleasantly surprised there in your presence Lord I pray for my friends for the servants of this church who suffer in silence with different things Lord I praise you for those who serve in silence never looking for a badge or a trophy or their name to be written on a wall or spoken from the stage Lord I thank you for all of those among us who have for so long and in so many different ways to strive to be who you've called them to be and to do what you've called them to do and I pray that you would just affirm their calling today in the silence that you would just whisper in that still small voice well done I love you, you're doing a good job thank you that they could just hear the affirmation not of their pastor but of their father in heaven because I know you're pleased, Lord. Speak that word to them. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for making us a part of your story. And Lord, I will never understand how you kept your mouth shut amidst all those false accusations and illegal trials. But I thank you for giving an example for all of us and for showing us how beautiful the silence can actually be and how much glory God can get from it. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we ask and we pray this now in the name of Jesus, amen.